Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Muhammad Ali was a very charismatic boxer. And there was a story told one time when he was uh, on an airplane flying to one of his, one of his uh, matches that the stewardess, uh, the flight attendant, came up to him and asked him to sit down and put his seatbelt on because they were getting ready to take off. And he said, semi-jokingly, semi-not, he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And, the, and the, uh, the flight attendant, very quick on her feet, said, well, Superman don't need no plane to fly. Now sit down and put your seatbelt on. Muhammad Ali had a big ego, no doubt about it. Uh, he also had a talent that seemed to nearly match that ego, uh, even going so far as to refer to himself many times as the greatest. That became one of his uh, catchphrases he was known by. I am the greatest, he would say many times. Well, if you were to make a list of the greatest boxers of all time, I suppose he would be very close to the top of the list for many people. And this is a time of year uh, where we see a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things. You know the, you know the best of 2018, top 10 of 2018. You know the greatest this or that or whatever. And if someone were to ask about the greatest <laughs> verses of the Bible, maybe if someone asked you that question, what's your favorite verse of the Bible? Well, I've, I've been asked that question before, and I have a hard time narrowing it down. But at the top of many people's lists would be John 3.16. It's been referred to as the golden verse. Uh, John 3.16, of course, you see it on the sign. Not so much, not as much as you used to, but you still see it from time to time. People holding up signs at sporting events and things. and uh, You see it um, in the public domain many times. And there's a reason for that. It is a very powerful verse. It is a very far-reaching verse. Uh, it's even been referred to as, we'll look, examine today, some have said that, that John 3.16 contains really all of the essential information of the Bible, the message of the Bible. It is in some ways the Bible in miniature. And we'll be con considering that thought today as we, as we uh, break down John 3.16. But what I want to do in looking at this today, turn to John 3.16 if you're not already there. But what we'll see as we examine this this morning is that each word, if we consider it in its detail, each word of this, of this verse tells us about the greatest things that there are. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. John 3.16 tells the entire story of God's plan of salvation from the beginning and why we should believe and accept it. So we will start with the greatest of all things, and that would be God himself. John 3.16 begins by describing, uh, referring to the greatest being, and that is God. Uh, it's the beginning of the verse, but God is the beginning of everything. He is the beginning. Gen Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning, God. Because there was no one else there. He was the only one in existence. He created everything. Jesus referred to uh, this in Revelation when he said that I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha being the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega being the final letter of the Greek alphabet of which the new, in which the New Testament was written, we would say today that he is the A, A to Z. God is the greatest being, so it's only fitting to start there. And it's also important to remember that he is the only real God. Many gods in the world today, little g, many things that people worship, but God is the only true God. In the Ten Commandments to Israel, two of the of God's top ten, if you will, refer to this idea of false gods. The first two commandments, uh, that there is no other God besides God, and that man should not worship any other God besides Him. 
It's fitting that God would start there because this is something that is a temptation for humans in all times and in all cultures. Later in Israel's history, the prophet Jeremiah even talks about this. Centuries after God has revealed himself to Israel, after he's entered into the covenant with them, and yet this is still a problem. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 5, the prophet Jeremiah is, is remarking on the, the folly, the foolishness of trying to worship something besides God. God is the only eternal uh, being. Everything else was made by Him. Okay. This is a matter of worshiping the creation instead of the Creator. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 5 he talks in this chapter about how men will take a piece of wood and they will fashion a god out of it. They'll take a piece of wood and they will carve it. And they will embellish it with, with gold and, and, and jewels and things and, and carve it in a beautiful way as an object of worship. And Jeremiah says they are upright like a palm tree. They take this, this, this statue, this carving, and set it up and worship it. He says they are upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. <coughs> they must be carried, because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. That last part is most important. He said you'll worship these, these objects, these idols, and they can't talk. They can't interact with you. They can't speak. They don't do anything, and if they want to go anywhere, somebody has to pick them up and carry them somewhere else. Foolishness. Isaiah said much the same thing in chapter 44 of his prophecy. He said, you'll take a piece of, you'll chop down a, a big log out of a tree, and half of it, you'll carve a god out of it, and the other half, you'll chop up and use for firewood to cook your food. Well, you better make sure you got the right half. Hopefully you didn't chop up the god part for firewood, and you're worshiping the firewood now. But of course, he said, you know, it's, it's all firewood. Makes no sense. God is the only real God. Even the heathen king Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, recognized this in Daniel chapter 3. When Daniel's three young friends refused to worship this golden image that the, that the king had set up, and the proclamation was given then that whoever will not bow down and worship this image will be thrown into a fiery furnace. The death penalty. And when the three men are brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, he gives them one more chance. He said, bow down and worship my image or I'll throw you in the fiery furnace. And he said, this is what I had commanded. And who is the God who will save you from my hand? He so arrogantly asks. Who is the God who will save you from my hand? Well, these three young men told him. The one eternal true God is the one who will save us from your hand. And indeed he did. And after Nebuchadnezzar had witnessed these three young men thrown into the fiery furnace, and not even a hair on their head was sinned. Not even the smell of smoke was upon their clothes. Even he recognized no other God can save like this. He was forced to admit their God was the one true, the only real God. So John 3.16 begins with the greatest being, God. Only God had the power to help mankind in the situation we were in. And he was motivated to use that power by his love. The next phrase, God so loved. Love is greater than any other power in the universe. We're told of its power and importance in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. He's talking to the church in Corinth about their use of spiritual gifts. They have gifts of healing and prophecy and speaking in tongues and, and discerning spirits and all of these other things. And he says, all of these powers pale in comparison to love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and in angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains, but have love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. He sums it up in verse 13 of chapter 13. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the greatest motive. 
In the New Testament, it's the Greek word agape that we often uh, look to as, the, as the, the pinnacle of love. It is the highest form of love. We love many things. We can say, well, I love ice cream or I love my wife. But this kind of love is something even beyond that. It is higher than that. This form of love is that which seeks the best for another despite the personal cost. It means doing good without the hope of repayment or even of gratitude. And is this not exactly what God did for us on the cross? What did the cross cost God? It cost Him His dearest, His only begotten Son. It cost Him Himself. And that gift was largely rejected in Jesus' time, and still is to this very day. And yet, it was love, the love of God, that bestowed that gift, that made that gift available. God's love was stronger than our sin. And our need was very great. The next word in the verse shows the greatest need, and that is of the world. For God so loved the world. God made the world. And after he made the world, he said, it is very good. And it wasn't very long after that, that God saw that very good creation ruined by sin. And he destroyed it with the flood in the time of Noah. But even then, he had put his plan in place to save the world from itself. Because he loved it. In John 3.16, the word world comes from the Greek word cosmos. And it has many different applications, many different interpretations. Sometimes this word refers to the created world, the earth, or the universe even, the physical world. Sometimes it refers to the idea of the worldly, the flesh as opposed to the spirit. Uh, the worldly and the flesh as opposed to the, the heavenly or the spiritual. That kind of contrast. Other times the world simply refers to the lost and sinful world. The people of it. And that's the usage that is used here in John 3.16. For God so loved lost sinners that that love motivated him and he had to do something about it. For God so loved the world. He had to do something about this sin problem and it was going to take a perfect sacrifice that only He could provide. Next, John 3.16 tells us about the greatest sacrifice. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. When we look at Paul's letter to the Romans, in chapter 5, Beginning in verse 7, we see God's commitment, the level of this love and this sacrifice. Romans chapter 5 and verse 7, Paul writes, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet even perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, sin is so offensive to God. I think we fail to appreciate that sometimes. But sin is so offensive to God that it requires a death. It requires that blood be shed. In the Hebrew letter of our New Testament, it tells us there that animal blood couldn't do it. It wasn't powerful enough to take away our sin. It was only a shadow. It was only a... a a looking forward to a preparation for Christ's sacrifice on the cross, for His blood. But His blood was not shed on the altar like, the, like those animal sacrifices, but it was shed on the cross. You may have, sometimes it's very poetically stated in, in some hymns and songs that, that, that the blood of Jesus was spilt. And I take some, take some umbrage with that idea. When I think of something being spilled, I think of it as an accident. You know, you trip and fall, and oh, look, it's all over the floor now. The blood of Christ was not spilt as if by accident, but it was shed purposely, decisively. 
Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 reminds us that aside from Christ, if there is one who would reject Jesus, if one has been cleansed of sin by the blood of Christ and then falls back into that sin, the Hebrew writer says there no longer remains any sacrifice for sin. It's not stating that that person could never repent and find forgiveness again. But if we fall back into that sin after we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ, there's no greater power to cleanse us. There is no more sacrifice for sin because God can't give any more than He gave. He can't give a, a, a gift any better than He provided. If you reject Jesus, there's not another Savior coming along. He's it. John 3.16 tells us about the greatest sacrifice, the only begotten Son of God. And this gift was freely given. And it was given in the best deal that has ever been brokered in human history. In one word, in John 3.16, we find the greatest offer that whosoever believeth in Him. Whosoever. I love this word. And I think it's tragic that some of the more modern translations have taken it out. The meaning is still uh, rendered there, but I just love this idea of whosoever. It may be the most encouraging word in the entire life. <coughs> whosoever. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, and he reminded them that in Christ, in the body of Christ, in the church, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither male nor female, there is neither rich nor poor, there is neither uh, any other line of division that you can come up with. But all are one in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? It means we're all the same. Whosoever means that anybody can come to Christ. Anybody can find forgiveness. Anybody can find salvation in the blood of Jesus. Paul wrote in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All stand in condemnation. All have missed the mark that God has set, the standard. None of us meet it. None of us could ever meet it. But just as all have sinned, likewise all can be saved. Who's the gospel for? Whosoever will. Jesus died once for all. Not for most, not for some, but for all. Whosoever. We see in that word, whosoever, the value of a soul to God. Jesus made a statement in Matthew chapter 16 about what would a man exchange <coughs> in the goods of the world for his own soul. And the idea that we have there is if you could take all of the wealth and the, and the gold and the, and the money and the jewels and the, 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 the stock options and every other thing of value that you can possibly think of and pile it up in one place at one time, it wouldn't be enough to buy a soul. One soul is worth more than all of the world's wealth. The soul of each individual person each individual person sitting here today, each individual person outside this building, walking down the street, anywhere in the world today, each individual soul is worth more than all of the wealth that there's ever been in the world. That means the prostitute, the drug dealer, the murderer. That soul is as equally precious to God as Moses's, as Peter's, and yours. Who is it that Jesus spent a lot of his time with? Much to the chagrin of his critics. Well, it was with what we would call, you know, the dregs of society, the people on the wrong side of the tracks. Many reasons for that, but the fact remains. Jesus lived that concept of whosoever, whosoever will hear me, whosoever will come and obey, can be saved. The gospel is for all, whosoever will. Will do what? That's the next part. With the greatest offer, we have the greatest command. God so loved the world, 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him. Now when we talk about faith, we might need to talk about two parts of it. There is mental faith. The mental aspect of faith, which is understanding Jesus' words, understanding what he said, understanding the commands and the promises that were made. And it means accepting and trusting them to be true. That's part of what believing in Jesus means. And it means making a commitment to remaining faithful, to continuing to understand and appreciate those concepts. But where there is mental faith, there is also equally important, obedient faith. Faith, true biblical faith, is not simply a mental exercise. It requires action. James refers to the works of faith and obedience. He says faith there involves works and obedience. They go together. In John chapter 3 and verse 36, there's a read from the New King James here. It says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And it's unfortunate that translation is not exactly accurate. If you were to look in uh, some newer ver uh, translations, uh, like the New American Standard or the English Standard, they use a different word there in that translation. It reads, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life. And that's actually more accurate. But, what the King James said is still true. Believing and obeying are inextricably linked. They are two different words. But both are equated with life. You can't have life, true, eternal, spiritual life, without both. Believing and obeying. But you see, our Father, our Heavenly Father, does not want His beloved children to die. To suffer the effects of sin. Which is what brought this all on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That who, whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Death. Spiritual death. Separation from God is the greatest tragedy that there could be. And that is of course God's greatest fear that we do fail to obey. That we reject that gift of salvation. That is God's greatest fear. That's why he's waiting. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter is writing to those who would say, well, what's God waiting for? It's been a long time. Why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Maybe he's not coming back. Peter writes to a lay little spirit and says, no, it's not that he's forgotten about it. But he says, God is not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anyone to be lost. So he's giving them time to repent. Paul said something similar in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. He said that God does not desire the death of the wicked, but he desires that all come to know the truth and repent. That's what God wants more than anything. And his greatest fear is that we will die apart from him. Death is not simply physical death in the scriptures, but, but in its fullest form, death is eternal separation from God. That's what we see in 2 Thessalonians 1.9 being cast apart from God in eternal darkness, separated from Him. And that's why God went to such great lengths to avoid this fate. He didn't want us to die and to be lost to Him. So that is why He put all of this in motion. And He wants to give us that greatest reward, which is everlasting life. Coming up in February is, uh, is Groundhog Day. And I love that time of year because it means that one of my favorite movies will be shown on TV. Groundhog Day, the movie with Bill Murray. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. And I always love this opportunity because I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll purposely try to set this up so I'm watching it. And my wife will come in the kitchen and she'll, and she'll see it on TV and say, Are you watching Groundhog Day again? And I'll turn to her with a very confused look on my face and say, 
What do you mean to give? If you've seen the show, then you know the premise of it is that a man gets looped into living the same day, February 2nd, over and over and over again, hundreds, thousands of times, and he can't do anything about it. Well, because he knows everything that goes on, he begins to go around in this town and find out all of the different things that happen every day, and he knows exactly when somebody drops a plate, he knows exactly when somebody crosses the street, and all of these little insignificant things, and he knows all of this. And there's one scene that I always think about where he's walking down the street, kind of muttering to himself, and he looks at his watch, and then he looks at it again really quickly, and he begins to take off running at a dead sprint, and he's running down the sidewalk, and he dives and makes this diving catch with this little boy who falls out of a tree. And the little boy gets up and, and kind of brushes himself off and takes off running. And uh, Bill Murray's character says, all right, what do you say? What do you say? What are you supposed to tell me? He says, you never thank me. So he, you know, he does this every day. He goes and saves this boy from falling out of a tree, and he says, you never thank me. Wouldn't it be great if he just stopped climbing that tree? Wouldn't that be a lot easier? I wonder if God ever feels the same way with us. Wouldn't it be easier if instead of forgiving us of our sin, we just quit sinning? Wouldn't that be a lot simpler? You see, God doesn't want to just save us from death. He doesn't want to just save us from our sins so that he can say, okay, save you again tomorrow. That's not what he desires. He wants something better for all of us. When Jesus was telling his disciples about why he had come, he said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, in that great passage about how he is the good shepherd, guarding and protecting the sheep, he said, I have come so that they may have life and that they may have it in abundance. Not just life, not just a little more of the same old, same old. But he came to bring abundant life, overflowing life. See, the world can't promise or deliver anything beyond the grave. This life is all there is for this material world. But Jesus promises blessing both here and in the hereafter. Because only Jesus has the keys to eternity. So in this one verse... In this one verse of Scripture, we have pretty much the whole story of man's redemption as it has been orchestrated by God. We see who acted, why he acted, who this was done for, and what the terrible cost was. And we see that anyone can receive this great gift and avoid certain death by trading it for eternal life. John's 3.16 is in many ways the Alpha and the Omega of Scripture. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. And that really says it all you would like to experience that everlasting life, if you'd like to experience the forgiveness of your sin through this great gift of God, given by His great love for you, then come today, obey the gospel, repent of your sin, confess Jesus as Lord, be baptized, immersed in water that your sins might be washed away. Or if you've neglected this great gift, then we urge you to reconnect, recommit yourself to the cause of Christ. Recommit yourself to God. Humble yourself in submission to Him again. And He will bestow that same love that He still carries for you. If you have a need of the church that we can help you with today, please come as we stand and sing this song. There is